many of you believe the Lord inhabits? The Lord inhabits the praises of his people. One of the greatest ways to enter into God's presence is to praise him. I was reading some Psalms this week and I uh, stumbled over Psalms 150. Y'all know what it says. It says, let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. I just would believe every person in here has got some breath. Come on now. If you got some breath, you just got to praise him. Come on now. And when you praise him, something great happens. The greatness is God and his presence that comes into your life. That's why oftentimes I just wait a little bit for the presence of God. Because the goal is to experience God. That's the key. You got to experience God. One of the greatest ways to enter into his presence, once again, is when you praise him. So if you got some breath, make sure you praise God. Don't halfway praise him. Come on. How many believe you just got to go after him? For everything that's within you, you got to go after him. I was reading another psalm, and the psalm said that Jesus was the governor of planet Earth. Governor Jesus. I mean, you're glad that he's the governor. Come on now. I mean, you're glad that you submit to the lordship of his governance in planet Earth. Jesus Christ, Governor Jesus and his governance in your life. So, Lord, we once again say thank you so much for your wonderful love, for your grace and your mercy, but for your grace, Lord, we wouldn't be here. So, Lord, we don't think that we're anything within ourselves because we absolutely know that we're not. Because your word says that let a man that think of he standeth take heed lest he also fall. And your word says that pride goes before a fall and that you hate a hearty heart, but you give grace to the humble. So, Lord, tonight we choose to decrease while you increase. We choose, Lord, to submit to your lordship. Lord, we choose to worship, to praise, and give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. And we declare and we decree that there is none besides you, that you are God. And we acknowledge you, Lord, as our God. And we welcome you, Lord, into all of our hearts and lives and into this sanctuary and through the airways. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Every person that's with us tonight, we release you, Lord, into their life to meet every need that they have. Lord, bring peace. Bring your great love, Lord. Bring hope, God. Bring vision, Lord. Give them purpose, Lord. Lord, we ask you right now, Lord, that you would deliver and set free those that are bound, Lord, that are oppressed, that you will set the captives free. And, Lord, we hear your word that says in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, when you talked about the mission of the Holy Ghost, you said, Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and set at liberty those that have been wounded and bruised in life and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord for today is the day of salvation. So Lord, today, any person that doesn't know you, we pray that you will save them. Come on, church. 
Say, Lord, save them right now. Lord, anybody that's oppressed, we pray now, Lord, that you would deliver them right now. Now, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray for those that are hurting, that need to be healed, that, Lord, that you would heal them right now in the name of Jesus. Say, Lord, heal them right now. Lord, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus for all the needs, God, those that are financially struggling. Lord, those that need a miracle and a breakthrough in their finances, that you would supernaturally intervene in their finances right now. Pray with me. Say, Lord, anybody struggling financially, we pray now, Lord, meet their needs. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord God that provides. Do it now, Lord. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you set the captives free. Now say with me. Say, Lord, you set captives free. And whom the Son is made free is free indeed. Lord, we're free. And you're setting others free right now. And we thank you for it now. In the name of Jesus, we all pray. And we say, Amen. 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 So be it. All right, if you got your um, Bibles tonight, um, your handouts will start there and uh, get your Bibles ready. We'll be going into Isaiah in a minute. We're talking to you about Jesus Christ. Look at your neighbor and say, it's all about Jesus. I love what Paul said. Paul said he didn't desire to know anything except Christ and him crucified. Come on now. And raised from the dead. So tonight we want to talk to you about prophecy. The prophecy that prophesied that the Christ, the anointed one, would come into the world and his mission and what he would do. We call it the gospel. Look at your name and say gospel. You got to say it like this. Say gospel. <laughs> and say and not gospel. Up. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right. You got to go poo. You got gospel. It's good news. So we want to talk about the good news of Jesus and his mission tonight. We want to look at the prophecies in the scripture where it was prophesied that Christ would actually come and then his mission and what he would come for. And we'll take a look at that. Propitiation and power. We'll look at that as well. So uh, last week we talked about crucifixion, right? You remember Jesus Christ being crucified. We asked the question, why did Jesus have to go through such a gruesome death like crucifixion, why would God the Father make Jesus or allow Jesus to go through crucifixion? Why, why couldn't have we just um, cut his head off just real quick, cut his throat? But why did he have to go through so much pain and so much suffering? And we realized last week is, is that that's really what we look like with our sin debt that had to be paid. And so God allowed Jesus Christ to go through what he went through to pay our debt. Aren't y'all glad that you, you're free today, that Jesus has paid your debt? So, so this week now, we talked about him being crucified. We talked about him dying. This week, I want to talk about Jesus Christ being buried. Is, not You don't hear a lot of sermons on Jesus being buried. You know what really happened, but it's in line with our teaching in Matthew. By the way, we're at chapter 27. This is our sixth sermon out of 27, I think. We preach six messages out of um, chapter 27. And so what we're going to talk about tonight is, is what took place when Jesus Christ was buried. And what really happened to Jesus' spirit and soul for 72 hours while his body went to the grave? 
where did his spirit and his soul go? Somebody said up. I'm saying down. So, I mean, we're going to look at that. We'll look at that. But you do go up now because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But Jesus had to make a little pit stop in hell. Didn't he need some keys? Didn't, he up, didn't the devil have to up some keys? Oh, the keys of death, hell, and the grave. All right. Praise the Lord. So Jesus had a little mission for 72 hours to ta- take care of kingdom business. Come on now. Before he sent it on high. We want to take a look at that tonight. Are y'all alive in here? All right. Hey, do y'all love the Bible like I do? Is it awesome or what? All right, so praise the Lord. So let's take a look at prophecy first then. So here's the three Ps, prophecy, propitiation, and power. I mean, you know, when you get resurrected, that's power. All right, so, uh, so Christ then fulfilled the Scriptures, and we'll take a look at that. Here we go then. Um, we're in um, Isaiah 53, 1 through 12, and here's what the Scripture says. Who has believed our report? And this is Isaiah prophesying, the prophet Isaiah. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? So, you know, I looked at that scripture many, many times, and it says this. It says, who will believe our report? And to whom will the power, the arm of the Lord, be revealed to? How many of you know that you got to believe in Jesus Christ tonight? And you got to believe in the power of the living God. And that's why the scripture says, who has believed our report? I mean, you know that we're believers. We believe in Jesus. And the, and the scripture says, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as the, a root out of a dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, There's really no beauty that we should really desire him. Next scripture. So then he is despised and what? You ever been despised in your life? Ever been rejected? You know, there's a lot of us that have um, really been wounded by other people in our lives by being rejected or ridiculed, mocked, come against. And as a result, it's caused deep wounds in our spirit. And because of those deep wounds, it makes us act out like we act out in our lives. That's why lots of times when people are are not acting like they should, I always ask the question now, why are they acting like they're acting? What really happened? Because where there's fruit, there's always a root. But Jesus, the Bible says, he was rejected, he was despised. How many know he paid for your rejection? He paid for those that have despised you. Jesus was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. And as it was, we, uh, we hid our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has what? Born whose griefs? Ours. So look at your neighbor and say ours. Say Jesus has carried. He's born all of our grief. He's carried our sorrows. Yet some kind of way, we did not esteem him as stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. How many know that God allowed him to go through what he went through? Verse 5, but he was wounded for what? For our transgressions. He was bruised for what? Our iniquities. The chastisement of whose peace? Our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. That's that's what we've been teaching, that when you see the suffering Jesus, the crucified Jesus, 
and the stripes that were being laid on him, and you see the blood splatter, when you see Christ go through what he went through, and you know it's for you, when you know it's for you, it does something. It releases spiritually his power in your life that brings healing. It brings deliverance. Listen, if anybody has despised you or mocked you or hurt you or come against you, Take your eyes off of them and look at the suffering Jesus. See the crucified Jesus. When you see Christ going through what he, he went through to bear your sorrow, to bear your grief, to bear your iniquities, he took this upon him for our deliver, our peace. And when you see that, it releases that. Come on now. Say, when you see Jesus, it releases Jesus. What you see is what is released in your life. That's why perspective is so important in all of our lives. That's why you must always see the goodness of God. Faith is believing in the goodness of God. If you continue to see what's wrong, that's what will come into your life. Whatever you perceive is what you give power to, to manifest in your life. You never... You never operate in negativity. You never see what's wrong. You always see what's right. You never not believe good. You always believe good. Because when you believe in the goodness of God, it releases the goodness of God. When you see Christ, it releases Christ. That's how it works. Some people say, man, I've been praying and where nothing's happened. I've been praying for healing and nothing's happened. Keep praying, girl. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. Keep asking. Come on now. I mean, you know, you got to keep asking. You got to keep knocking. You got to keep seeking. And I'm not just saying out in, in the never, never lands. What I'm saying is, is that if you've not received healing, then you got to put on healing scriptures and memorize them and meditate on them and ponder them. And you got to continue to take your imagination and see Christ in those stripes that were laid on his back. And when you see Christ, when you get it in your heart, it's going to release the power of God in your lives. A lot of people don't receive from the Spirit of God is because they're in the flesh and you can't receive a miracle in the flesh. You can only receive receive a miracle in the spirit realm. you got to get out of this realm. That's why you never receive. Because you can't be carnal. You can't be fleshly and receive a spiritual miracle from God. you got to enter into the spirit realm with him. And when you enter in with him, you're with him. And his power manifests. So the Bible says, and this is prophesying Jesus, says all of us like sheep have done what? So how many are righteous? None, not even one, okay. And we've what, turned everyone and we're all doing what? Our own thing, we're all going our own way. And the Lord has laid on who? Jesus, the iniquity, iniquity is what? Iniquity is sin, but iniquity is another level of sin. You know why? Because iniquity is a sin of the heart. You can, you can have sin iniquity in your life, and I not know that you got sin in your life because it, it's not manifested out here, but it's in you. That's why Jesus said he looks upon the heart of a man. Listen, you can have hatred, you can have ill will, some kind of malice against someone and not show it out here by putting the face on the mask and to act like you really do love them and you really care for them, but really in your heart you have iniquity. Iniquity is a sin of the heart. Jesus paid the price for your iniquity. So verse 7 says, we're in Isaiah 53, verse 7. Give your neighbor a high five. Say everything's all right. All right. So Jesus was oppressed. <laughs> Jesus was afflicted. Now, why would Jesus be afflicted and oppressed? Did he do it for him? 
Absolutely not. He did it for us, right? All right. So he, he did it so we wouldn't be oppressed. He did it so that we won't have to be afflicted. Aren't you glad that Jesus did that for us? No other way. And yet Jesus, he never opened his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shears is, is dumb. So Jesus never opened his mouth. Come on now. He just did it for us. He didn't, uh, he didn't say anything. He didn't quit. He just, he just laid his life down for all of us. He was taken from prison and from judgment. So how many of you know that Jesus had to go to prison for us? Death row. Then he was judged before the government. Pontius Pilate. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. Come on now. Why? For the transgression of my people was Jesus stricken. This is prophecy. And he made his grave with the wicked. You remember? He had two thieves that were crucified right beside him. You all remember that? So he was with the wicked. And then when he, when, when he died, Joseph, a rich man that had connections with Pilate, went and got Jesus' body. Shall somebody. And look what the Scripture says. And with the rich in his death. So Jesus was with the wicked, and the rich were with him too. Because he has done no violence, neither was any deceit in Christ's mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to do what? To bruise him. He has put Jesus to grief. When thou shalt make his soul a what? An offering for sin, propitiation. He shall see his seed. And he shall prolong his days. How many of you know? <laughs> How many of you believe that you're the seed of God? And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be what? Satisfied so that God would see Christ's offering, Christ's sacrifice. And God the Father himself would be satisfied. Look, that's a place for you to shout because if God is satisfied, now he's satisfied with you. And not because you did anything, but because Christ did it all for you. This is an exchange program. Give me all your bad and I'll give you all my good. And then you become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's why I've always taught that righteousness is not a performance. It's a, it, it's a position. He who knew no sin, Jesus, was made sin for me that I might become the righteousness of God. How? In Christ Jesus. So in Jesus I become right. Hallelujah. Praise you, the Lord. So well, what did you do to become right? Nothing. I just, I just believed in Jesus. And, I got, and, and when I believed in Jesus, the exchange program, he took all my oppression, he took all my grief, he took all my iniquity, he took all my sin, all my badness, if that's even the way to say it. He took everything that was wrong with me and took everything that's right with him and gave it to me. Hey, just like that, shout somebody. And then God the Father is satisfied with his sacrifice. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. I don't know about you, but I am shouting. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. Come on, Jesus. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he has poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many. 
and he made intercession for the transgressors who are us. Man, guys, that is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's keep moving with the scripture. Here's what the scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. We're talking about prophecy now. We're talking about Jesus fulfilling the scriptures. The scripture prophesied of Jesus Christ coming thousands of years before he came, and then he fulfilled the scripture to the letter. You can look at Psalms 22 and just write that down in your notes. You can look at Isaiah 714, Isaiah 9, uh, 6. So, so these are all prophecies of Jesus and how he would come and how he would die for us. I was reading also um, uh, Psalms uh, chapter 2, too, and talking about uh, Jesus and how he would die and how even people would mock him and wag their head when they saw him on the cross and him crying out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All of this is in the Scripture. So everything that Jesus did was already in the Scripture. And Jesus came and fulfilled God's sovereign will to manifest God's righteousness and God's holiness to us here in planet Earth. Listen, we serve a good God. He didn't leave us stuck out. He rescued us. He saved us. He set us free. And I don't know about you, but I'm shouting. And anytime you start preaching about this, demons do not like people getting free. So immediately you become a false prophet when you start preaching the suffering Jesus because demons hate Jesus and what he did because he sets the captives free. Shout somebody. Here's what Paul says. Paul says in verse 3 in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which what I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to what? The Scriptures. It was prophesied about him. And that he was what? Buried. And that he arose again the third day according to what? The Scriptures that prophesied that Jesus would be in the grave for three days, and on the third day he would arise from the dead. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. This is the resurrection. After that he was seen uh, above about 500 brethren at once. Now let me ask you something. If you were going to prove a person really did what he did, and you had all of these witnesses in a court of law, what would happen? If all of these people testified that they saw Jesus Christ ar ar arose from the dead, they saw their eyewitnesses, would the court, would the court uh, side with the witnesses? Obviously they would, right? So that's what he's saying. He's saying that 500 brethren at once saw Jesus uh, resurrected whom the greater part remained of this present time. So at the time that this was written, many of them were still alive, but some are fallen asleep. And this was um, while the Scripture was actually being written by Paul. Verse 7, after that he was seen of James and then all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of Paul the apostle, who was one that was born out of due time, meaning that Paul wasn't with the original apostles now, in order to be an apostle in the, in the uh, early church days, the criteria for being an apostle was is that you had to be an eyewitness of Jesus Christ. And if you didn't eyewitness Jesus Christ, then you, you could not be an apostle. Paul the apostle saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. Do you remember? So that made him an eyewitness of Christ and therefore qualified him to be an apostle. For I am the least of the apostles, that I um, that am not meant to be called. In other words, it's, it, I, I shouldn't even, I'm not even meet, to, I'm not even really considering myself qualification for apostle. Because Paul said, I persecuted the church. You guys know he killed Stephen and he chased Christians down, put them in jail and uh, he persecuted the church severely. I mean, you know that you can do bad things, but God has a way to get a hold of your heart and change your life. Come on now. 
So Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Look at your neighbor and say, by the grace. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, Paul, it was not in vain. Why? Because Paul said, because coming from where I came from, I labored more abundantly than all the other apostles. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. I mean, you know, if you do anything, it's by the grace of God. So, so we're talking about uh, prophecy that Christ fulfilled the Scriptures. Isn't it comforting that Jesus Christ actually fulfilled the Word of God that was written thousands of years before he showed up? You understand that what would be the odds of that? Okay, those are God odds. So number four, then you hand out propitiation. Christ's death then pays our price. And let's keep moving. So here's what the scripture says. Matthew chapter 27, verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, he's, he's being crucified, yielded up the ghost. So, so what's happening here? Jesus on the cross, when the time was perfect, I mean, you know, Jesus got perfect God timing. Dismissed his spirit and soul. Because he said, no man takes my life. He, he says, I lay it down freely and then I have power to take it back up again. Can't, <laughs> come on, still. You can't touch that. <laughs> so, so, so what is a, a person that's born into this world? I am a spirit, right? I have a soul that deals with my mind, my will, and my emotions, and I live in what? A physical body. I'll give you a, a scripture in, uh, in Thessalonians. It, this is what the scripture says. It says, I pray that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I quoted that scripture to say that you're a triune being, meaning that you have a spirit, you, uh, you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a physical body. Now Jesus, spirit, soul, and body as the God-man. He's on the cross he reaches the God time and he dismisses his spirit and his soul to leave his physical body. And that's physical death. Because your body is alive because of the spirit that's in you, right? All right. And when he did that, behold, the veil of the temple was rent. It was torn from the top to the bottom. And then we had some problems in earth. Come on now, when the creator... Um, physically died, the earth started shaking. There was an earthquake, and the rocks were shaken. Verse 52, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. I've been looking at that scripture for a long time. And came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city, and they appeared unto many. Now, um, and, of course, the centurion who was uh, the, the, the captain of the Roman army that was over that platoon, uh, this is what he said, watching, he saw uh, the earthquake and the things that were done, and they feared greatly, and truly he said, this was the Son of God. Are y'all out there? Verse 55 And many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him. And I just want to give kudos to the precious ladies because these precious ladies stuck with Jesus Christ. They were, they were there with him during his ministry. They were de there at the crucifixion. They were there at the tomb. Um, and so these precious ladies stuck with Jesus Christ. And by the way, ladies were not looked upon as um, authorities at that time. And so 
if you were going to have somebody witness for you, you wouldn't have a woman because their testimony at that time would not be accepted like a man's testimony. And I'm respectfully saying this because I believe that women have a say and I believe they're equal heirs of salvation with men. So I don't think man is better than woman. I don't think woman is better than man. I think we're all equal in Christ Jesus. Come on now. Uh, I think that there's differences, though, um, in um, obviously our temperaments. There's differences in our roles and our responsibilities, meaning that a woman is created by God to function a certain way, and obviously a man is created to function a certain way. And I believe that uh, a man is uh, the authority. He was created first, and I believe that that he's got a bigger responsibility than the woman in the sense that he's stronger. He should use his muscles not to beat her, but he should use his muscles to lead, feed, and protect her and provide for her. Right, guys? And he should lay his life down for his wife like Christ laid his life down for the church. So that role of a man is different from a woman because we're created different with different roles and responsibilities, right? But nobody's better than anybody. Okay, y'all got it. And there's an authority structure there. And if we'll follow God's authority and all of us do what we're supposed to do, then this thing will work right. It's when we don't do what we're supposed to do that we got problems. And I don't even know where I'm at. So I got to get out of that. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure that there's no rocks being thrown at me. Praise the Lord. And all the ladies said amen. amen. All right. And you guys talk to Sister Jeannie and see if, see if I'm what I say that I'm teaching you. I try hard to make sure I'm a good, a good husband, a good provider, and that, that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And my wife doesn't have any problem looking up to me and respecting me because how I many you know in your life, you get credits and debits, right? For every good decision you make, you get a credit. It's just like a bank account. Got to have some money in it, right? And every bad decision you make, you get a debit. Sir, if your credits outweigh your debits, she'll trust you. She'll follow you. So make sure you're not bankrupt in your account. You make good decisions. And when you make good decisions, you follow the Lord, and you're doing what you're supposed to do, a woman will have no problem submitting and following you as you submit to Christ, sir. That's how that thing works. So this is what Jesus said then. Jesus is um, giving up his spirit um, and, 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 and on the cross, and, and he says this. He says, and other sheep I have which are not of this fold. And I, I just believe that that's the Gentiles. He ministered to the Jews first. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one sheepfold and one shepherd. Come on now. Jesus is the shepherd of us all, whether you're a Gentile or a Jew. Whether you're male or female, Jesus is the shepherd of us all. Let's keep moving. Next slide. No man, uh, Jesus said this, John 10, 16 through 18. He says, no man takes my life. He says, I lay it down freely, and I have power to take it back up again. And he received this commandment from God the Father. So how many of you know that Jesus had to dismiss his spirit and his soul in order to die because he had the authority of life? to actually take his life back up again. And that's why we call Jesus the resurrection and the life. Aren't you glad about that? Shout somebody. All right, here we are, number five, and this is our last point tonight. And I'll try to capsulize this. We're talking uh, about the power and the resurrection. My question was, was where did Jesus' spirit and soul go for 72 hours until he resurrected. Are y'all ready? Let's take a look at that. Y'all remember the story in Luke chapter 16, Lazarus and the rich man. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in what? Purple, and he was clothed in fine linen. 
He fared sumptuously every day. He was rich. And there was a certain beggar, the beggar's name was Lazarus, which was laid at his gate. Lazarus was poor and he had sores on him. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. And even the dogs came and licked Lazarus' sores. Are y'all alive out there? All right. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels, and this is a key word right here, into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, the rich man lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Let let me just tell you what I think that we're seeing right here in the Scripture. I believe hell has different departments in it. I believe hell is like Angola that has different camps. And the reason why I say that is because it says that some sinners will be beaten with many stripes. what What I mean by that is is that there are different degrees of sin. Some people say all sin is sin. All sin is sin in in the sense that sin will send you to hell. All sin will send you to hell. But there are some sins that are worse than other sins that will have different degrees of punishment. Just like there are certain degrees of punishment in our physical prisons like Angola. Camp J is a different level of punishment at Angola. The trustee camp is another level of discipline or another level uh, of punishment. So if you're a trustee in prison, then you're still being punished, but the punishment is not as bad as Camp J, lockdown, and if you really get bad, we will... Take all your clothes and put you in the cell naked. And then we would just feed you a certain type of food. So in hell, there are different departments, I believe. I believe before Jesus Christ made the way for us to go straight to heaven, that Abraham's bosom which was a holding place for saints that died before Jesus Christ died to take us to heaven. In other words, we couldn't go straight to heaven until Jesus the first fruits died and made the way for us to go to heaven. So now when we die, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, we go straight to heaven. But before Jesus Christ made the way for us to go to heaven, there was a place that God Uh, placed in hell, which was called Abraham's bosom, but the difference was, was on this side of the gulf, they had air conditioned, and on that side of the gulf, there was a barbecue. So, and that's what the Scripture's saying, that, that Lazarus and the rich man both died. Lazarus, even though he didn't have the good things of this life, Still, he had faith in God, obviously. I mean, you know that maybe some of the good things of life might would keep you from seeing God. So it might be best to be Lazarus here. And so when they both died, one went to a place called hellfire, and the other went to a place called Abraham's bosom. Now we pick it up in verse 24, and and. And so now the rich man cried and said, Father Abraham. Now look who's running the camp for Jesus. Abraham, the father of our faith, is still a leader for God even in the spirit realm. And I say that to say that your faithfulness here in this life serving God will still carry on even in the spirit realm. Do you know that what you learn here, uh, your maturity, your leadership, your love, 
Everything that you are here, you take it with you to the glory of God in the next dimension of life. Y'all are getting quiet in here. Y'all. So what you're doing here is not for just here. That's why it's so important to mature. It's so important to, to be a solid person. God, it's 8 o'clock already. Can y'all believe that? I'm going to quote a lot of this so I can get us out of here. So when Lazarus the rich man looked across the gulf into the air conditions of space of hell, he saw, he saw Lazarus over there and Father Abraham. Father Abraham was with Lazarus. He immediately talked to the head that was running Abraham's bosom, which was Abraham. He said, Father Abraham, Father. Look what he was still thinking. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and put a drop on my tongue for I am burning in these flames. And Abraham said, look now. You fared sumptuously, and you had everything, and you wouldn't even give Lazarus a, the time of the day or a crumb from your table. And now Lazarus is comforted, and you are in torment. And then he said, but Father Abraham, please let somebody resurrect from the dead and go down and I have brothers and tell them, uh, uh, give them the revelation that if they don't get it right with God, they're going to come to a terrible place like this called hell. And Abraham said, he says, they have the prophets. They have the word of God. Let them hear them. And neither would they believe if one arose from the dead if they won't receive from the word of God. Same thing with us today, guys. Here's a couple of talking points and thinking points that I want to think about just for a second. First of all, never kid yourself that if I commit suicide, that some kind of way... I'm living in hell here in some kind of way. I'm not going to live in hell there. Because the rich man was crying in the flames saying, man, I'm burning up. I need some water. Just give me one drop. I don't know what one drop's going to do you. But when you get that kind of Obviously, a drop is, I don't know what kind of torment you're in where one drop's going to help you out. But I want you to see that in the spirit realm, you still are going to have feelings. You're still going to hurt. You're still going to remember. Listen, you remember your family. Maybe one of the worst things in hell will be that you remember all the opportunity you had to make Jesus Lord of your life and, and all the opportunity that you had to listen to the preacher. Instead, you wanted to call me a heretic and attack me. When that was the only salvation and, I, and the opportunity you had to get it right with God. So the answer to all the questions here, where was Jesus Christ, the spirit and soul, for 72 hours before he resurrected from the grave? The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 that what is it that he ascended, but that he first descended, and he went down into the lower parts of the earth. That's why I tell you that hell is down, not up the lower parts of the earth, and then he led captivity captive. So what did Jesus do? When Jesus Christ left, his spirit and his soul left the crucifixion, jumped out of his body. When his spirit and soul jumped out of his body, 
The Bible says that he descended and he went down where all the saints were being held before Jesus Christ actually died because they couldn't go to heaven because Jesus had not made the way to heaven. So what Jesus did was, was he gathered up all of those souls. Lazarus was one of those. Adam and Eve were another. Uh, Isaac and Jacob and all the Old Testament saints that died before Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that he led captivity. In fact, in 2752 in Matthew, the Bible says that when Jesus Christ led the way, the graves opened up. And their spirit and soul jumped into their body, and that's the first resurrection. That when Jesus resurrected as the first fruits, he led captivity captive, and the rest of the folks that were in the grave uh, in Abraham's bosom, their spirit and soul jumped back into their body supernaturally, and they came out of the grave and started walking around Jerusalem. And then Jesus led them. Straight into heaven, shout somebody. <laughs> I mean, you say, I'm ready to go with Jesus. All right. I mean, you say that I don't care what camp is in hell, I ain't going to none of them, right? Camp JD, I'm not going to any one of them. Because <laughs> uh, I choose Jesus to pay the price of my sin, right? Let's pray and let's go home. Are y'all alive? All right. Thank y'all for listening to me every week. You know, um, I get real excited about communicating the truth of God's Word. And, and sounds never did come easy for me. You know, I, I had to really learn, you know, my vowels and stuff and sound. And, and, Little Sterling is the same way. I see him trying to talk, and he butchers words, and I'm, and I'm saying, God, I'm trying. I, to, I like need to communicate right to people so that they can get the truth, you know. So, I'm, what in the world? Why would you even call me? I wasn't a real good student in school, and what in the heck am I doing standing in front of you guys trying to give you eternal truths that? That's for eternity. And so I don't even know why I'm the least of the least, but I'm standing in front of you. I got the heart of God to love you and love God. And, and, and I care. And I'm, and I'm sure y'all cringe with some of the words and the way I say them. And I'm sorry for that. And just want y'all to know that I love you, okay? And, and I, I appreciate y'all so much. And just want to say thank you for spending time with me and being part of my life just love you. So let's just pray. Just, just say, Jesus, I need you. I realize that I can't do it. And within myself, I'm really nothing. And you're everything. So I ask you to forgive me and come live in me. Live your life through me. Change me and save me right now in the name of Jesus. Come on, give the Lord a great big shout in this place tonight. Love all of you guys. I speak God's favor and God's blessing upon you tonight. Have a great, 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 great night. We love you, all of us from Miracle Place Church. We bless you. Thanks for all of you guys that tune in with us every week. We're so glad to have you. We bless you in the name of Jesus. Have a great night.